Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hello to everyone. I'm Louisa Kasdan, your host for Let's Talk About Food, a podcast devoted to first-person storytelling where food plays a pivotal, if not a starring role. Everyone has a food story. Food is at the heart of human connection, at the center of love, of ritual, of need and want, and most of all, food creates community. And community is what we crave. We're calling this episode Greens Under Glass, how Paul Salou is reinventing your salad bowl. Paul Salou is the founder and CEO of Little Leaf Farms. His farm occupies massive greenhouses in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania, and he expects that by 2026, he'll have 100 acres under glass and be able to offer sustainable, crisp salad greens to over 50% of the American salad-eating world. We'll all be crushing on Little Leaf's hydroponic and sunshine-nourished salad greens. But he's not the only one who believes in his success. Super Sarbano and his Rise Fund recently made a $300 million investment in the company. That's a lot of arugula. Let's have a listen to Paul Salute. Paul, I'm so excited to talk to you. How did a guy who is six foot eight and at one point was a European professional basketball player, a Cornell University School of Agriculture graduate, end up operating this huge hydroponic lettuce leaf farm in the middle of Devons, Massachusetts. You're not even from Massachusetts. <laughs> How did all this happen? Well, I'm from, from New England, uh, grew up in Connecticut, and my family has a large-scale nursery, ornamental horticulture, in a town called Lebanon, Connecticut, in the eastern part of the state. So I grew up surrounded by agriculture, horticulture, and greenhouses. Always been in that type of business one way, shape, or form. And I, instead of looking at it from the standpoint of ornamental, which is like what you plant outside your home or flowers inside your home, I was more interested in food. And as I looked into it, New England, we import about 90% of the food that we eat. So I was a big believer in building a localized, more resilient New England food system. And then clearly with weather, obviously in the winter time, you needed to explore controlled environment ag. And that was very natural to me from where I grew up in our business, Pride's Corner Farms in Connecticut. So it was just a simple interest in building a more resilient food system. And we're part of that, along with everyone else who's growing food in New England. And I think there's a lot more room to grow. So you were this big, tall kid growing up in Connecticut. You could have done anything with that, including agriculture. Did you have a particular interest in food yourself? 
Yeah, obviously my my brother Mark took over the business. It was called Pride's Corner Farms and runs it now with two of his sons amongst several hundred other people. It's a large, <laughs> large scale operation. I just saw in many visits over to Europe, in particularly Holland, the enormous greenhouse industry they have there and the amount of food it produces, it virtually feeds Northern Europe. So I saw a model and I said, why can't we bring that over to New England? And I've lived in Massachusetts now for the last 25 years. Uh, this is my second greenhouse business. I started Backyard Farms in Maine growing greenhouse tomatoes about 20 years ago and then started Little Leaf about seven years ago. Uh, but same idea, just building a more localized, resilient food system. And you can do that with state-of-the-art greenhouses. Amazing. I haven't been to see your greenhouse yet, but I've seen another one that's in Massachusetts. And the thing that fascinated me was how busy and how quiet, but also how high-tech reliant we are on solar cells and everything else from China. How do you create a U.S. resilient food system without requiring technology from other countries? Well, right now, if you look at U.S. agriculture, we are a global superpower. I believe that the data says we're the largest exporter of food in the world, and we're in the top three of total food production along with India and China that has four to five times the population that we do. Mm. So we are clearly an agricultural superpower. But because we have microclimates, like parts of California, parts of Florida, the Midwest for grains, the upper Northwest for stone fruits, you have the ability to select crops and have them grow in these various microclimates in our vast country. The issue we have now is microclimates are no longer stable. What's happening, all you have to do is look at California. They've had massive flooding out there and in the Salinas Valley. That's where the lettuce is grown. So climate change is rearing its head. There are no more things that are really stable microclimates. So I view the controlled environment ag using state-of-the-art greenhouses is the future. And because we are a ag superpower, mostly in field agriculture, and we're a developing country when it comes to controlled environment and greenhouses. So it just makes sense to partner with technology providers in Northern Europe, and which is what we've done, and we've added our own developed technology to that, and then build it versus trying to invent everything from scratch. We just mm -hmm. view that as impractical. Well, what's fascinating to me is that when you speak about the, the greenhouses, why are we doing conventional agriculture? <laughs> it seems to me that from all of everything I read, controlled environment agriculture is the thing, especially with climate change happening. Yep, it's the future, and which is why investment is flowing in. But just look at the leafy greens. Right now, controlled environment leafy greens are less than 4% of what you see in the supermarket. I'm talking nationally. So we are still highly dependent upon places like the Salinas Valley, south of San Francisco and Yuma, Arizona during the winter time for those regions to grow virtually 95% plus of the leafy greens that we eat. So CEA for lettuce is new. We're one of the leaders in the country in that and we're aggressively growing. And I agree with you, there's a, there's a bright future and it's gonna continue to grow. When you say leafy greens, right now, are you selling any other products besides there are how many lettuce varieties that you sell? Yeah, we have a, a red leaf, we have a butter leaf, we have a green leaf. We also grow an herb, arugula, which is not a lettuce. So that's why we describe what we do <laughs> as leafy greens. We grow mizuna, though that's also an herb. But yeah, leafy greens just captures the entire category. I mean, it's such an incredible thing. And I spoke with a young man a few years ago who was creating a whole hydroponic garden in Saudi Arabia, I believe. He was just a few years out of college or graduate school, and he got money from the Saudi government to set up this huge thing. That makes sense to me in the desert as well. But what would it take for the balance to tip? For me, the idea that a head of lettuce gets on the truck 
in Salinas and gets to me five or six days later or 10 days later, or however many days later in Massachusetts, strikes me as crazy. So why I, isn't I, there more of it? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And yeah. But the, when you think about some of the fruits that we eat here, it might not come from California. It might come from Africa. It might come from South America. I mean, like our food system is global and the supply chains truly are global. So I love the saying when a reporter was interviewing a shopper at the grocery store and they said, well, what do you think about the plight of the American farmer? And the shopper answered, what do you mean? I buy all my food at the grocery store. Our food system is so incredibly, in, in many respects, vast and the supply chains are all around the world. It does create potential instability. Like when we had COVID, we saw the supply chains disrupted. So which is why we view uh, localized food. We, we view perimeters of outside of every major city. There should be high-tech state-of-the-art greenhouses growing a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. And we think that's the trend. We're at the beginning of that with leafy greens, but I think that trend is here to stay. And so would you see that every major metropolitan area, even in California, could have its own version of the farm that you have at in Fort Devens now? Yes. And I think, interestingly, in California, they will probably be adopting CEA for a simple reason, just water efficiency. You use so much less water, about 90 to 95% less than growing a field crop. So what California, outside of the recent tremendous rainfalls they've had. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, they were in a multi-year drought. So agriculture is by far and away the largest user of water in California. And so they will have to get more efficient. And it might be for a different reason, because again, you have microclimates, but you also don't efficiently use water by having those rain birds just irrigating on top of the ground. So CEA is just absolutely amazing in, in its ability to efficiently use water. Paul, not everybody knows this, goes through that conversion of the how much water hydroponic agriculture uses versus conventional agriculture, how much electricity, how you use sunlight. You just sort of break down the basics of the business model. Here in Massachusetts, it averages 45 to 50 inches of rain a year. So our greenhouses are designed to literally collect the water that falls on the roof. And it's directed to large basins that we have built next to the greenhouse that are lined. So we capture all that water because every farmer knows the best water is what falls out of the sky for free. So that's something really good that what we do. And then because we only provide the water that the plant needs and we capture 100% of all the drain water and have a sophisticated system to filter that water, clean that water, and then reuse that water. Unlike a field agriculture system where you might have rain birds just irrigating from the top, you obviously are not capturing that drain water. It's going into the soil. So there's a major difference right there with, with the way we run our greenhouses. And then from a standpoint of energy use, that's why we're a big proponent of greenhouses. We fully take advantage of the solar energy from the sun, that helps, obviously, to provide the full photosynthetic spectrum to grow our plants and also helps heat our greenhouses in the fall, winter, and spring. So that also reduces our energy costs significantly. There has been an uptick recently in what is called vertical farming, which is literally farms, quote-unquote, that are grown inside of literally converted warehouses. We don't believe that's a sustainable way to produce because you have to replace something that there's no reason to replace, which is the sun. It's free, it doesn't produce carbon, provides again, the full, everything you need to grow plants. So we have designed our greenhouses to be the most sustainable and lowest energy use as possible because we have a deep commitment to sustainability. That's a core value we hold dear here at Little Leaf Farms. And so if you were thinking about putting one of these greenhouses, let me just pick for an example. In Massachusetts or in New England, we have plenty of rain, typically, and not so much sun, typically. If you were in Arizona or Texas or California, you'd have plenty of sun, but not so much rain. So do you create the greenhouse to suit the environment or is it one size fits all? 
Yeah, you create the greenhouse to suit the environment. And no matter what environment you're in, whether it's an arid environment or a rainy environment like we have in New England, you still get the same benefits of the water use efficiency because you capture all the drain water and then reuse it. And ultimately, the only water you lose is through evapotranspiration in literally the water that's in the leaf itself. Regardless of an arid or rainy climate, you would design a greenhouse differently, but the water efficiency and, and how you use it is identical. Hmm. You'd have to adapt each. Yeah. And you have to use yeah. well water or yeah. somehow another source of water in an arid climate. Here, we use the rainwater that falls on a roof. I was noticing yesterday that there was a big announcement from the Biden administration about what to do about the Colorado water, Colorado River, and how to, and a proposal to essentially evenly split the use between residential use and farming use. You're sort of not in that picture at all because you're not dependent on that water, on an irrigated water source. That's correct. And, any, and when you look at how water is used in California and the whole water rights, agriculture is the dominant user of water by far. Mm -hmm. And now with that Biden administration ruling, ag is going to have significant cuts to its ability to use that water, which everybody saw this coming, right? When you have a water shortage, what will happen is that agriculture will lose out ultimately to the population, right, to the human population. And that's what's happening in the West now, and we think that's part of a long-term trend. So what will they do? Diversify our food systems. So then it goes back to exactly what Little Leaf Farms is doing. Instead of having all this concentration in California, which is over 3,000 miles from where we are talking right now, using state-of-the-art technology like controlled environment, high-tech greenhouses, you will diversify our ag production and make it a more resilient, localized food production system. And I think that is the ultimate answer. We're the leader in that in, in the leafy green space, but others will follow, and not only in leafy greens, but a wide array of other vegetables that can be grown in CEA systems. What kind of vegetables are next on your horizon? We're focused on leafy greens. We think it's a huge category. There's a wide variety of herbs that are available for us to grow. Other vegetables like spinach right now, which is a difficult crop to grow in a CEA, we're looking at that. And a wide array of lettuce products. So we're focused on leafy greens. We think we're the best grower in the world based on the quality and yields that we're getting at our facilities. And we're going to stay focused on that. And we'll be back in a minute with Paul Salou of Little Lee Farms, and he'll tell us how he built this company. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. And we are back with Paul Salou. I read all of your materials, and one of the things that jumped out at me was that last spring or summer, you got $300 million from the RISE Fund. One of the people behind the RISE Fund is Bono. Did you get to meet him? 
Not yet. <laughs> Be fun. You could send him a lot of leafy greens. He would probably show up. <laughs> Absolutely. So how does that happen? How do you go? Just how did you build this? Did you start with money from your other companies? And you said, this is what I'm going to do. I've learned what does work and what doesn't work. You spoke about a tomato. Was it a greenhouse tomato farm that you started? How did it get going? Well, there's no magic to starting a business. You have to have an idea. And if it's a good idea combined with good execution, you have a chance to be successful. So I'm grateful that we've had the success we've had to date. But as we all know, many new businesses fail, right? Either the idea is not as great as the founders think it is or poor execution or some other things happen. So it's always an interesting ride, the entrepreneurial journey and starting up businesses. And I've had the fortune to do this now a couple different times. But I went to an old friend of mine, a guy by the name of Bill Hellman. Bill and I put up the capital, Bill more than me. I signed on all the bank debt through Mass Development, who gave me the funding to start the business, signed personally, and did it the old-fashioned way. We believed in, in the power of our idea and that you could locally grow leafy greens. And I live outside of Boston, so I didn't want to travel. I wanted to have a facility here in Eastern Mass. That's why we picked Devons. And ever since, from that seven-year startup where we were in the market, we've been off to the races ever since. Business has gone well. And subsequently, when you grow a business, you need investment capital. If you want to grow faster, clearly, then your ability to generate internally generated profits that you'd want to reinvest. And we felt there's a big opportunity. And so there are pools of capital. That $300 million was a combination of equity capital from the RISE Fund and then debt capital from Bank of America, who's been a great partner of ours as well. And we got together with them. They believed in our vision. They're a very mission-driven organization and believe in creating a more sustainable world. So they, the values at the highest level were we were connected. And uh, very fortunate to have them on board. And with that capital now, we've been able to dramatically increase our capacity and build new greenhouses and increase our capacity and grow our product in the marketplace. It's a great partnership. What I read is that, I don't know if this is an aspiration or a plan, but that you think that you'll be able to have Little Leaf lettuce available to over half of the country by 2026. Yeah. Right now we have our 10 acres in Massachusetts. We built that in three phases. We have 20 acres in production in Pennsylvania. One currently is in full production. The other is starting up this summer. And we have 180 acres of land in Pennsylvania that can build significant more acreage in our greenhouses. And we have other locations as well we're looking at. So the ability to service the east of the Mississippi with an initial focus on the eastern seaboard is definitely within our reach. Wow. That's a lot of people. And and do you primarily sell through Whole Foods or are you essentially whatever grocery stores will take you? Yeah, we have a, a lot of great customers. We really do. I'm grateful for all of them. So we primarily sell into retail grocery under our brand name, Little Leaf Farms. And we also have a great food service business so that we sell the, some, the big food service distributors and they supply local restaurants and institutions, including like our flagship university here in Massachusetts, UMass. So, which by the way, is the number one rated food program in the country, multiple <laughs> years running under Ken Lung's leadership. We love our retail grocery customers. We love our food service customers. We love our institutions of higher learning customers. So they all share in common. Everyone is looking for great lettuce. So what's most fun about this for you? Well, I love farming and it's in my blood. New England is not really known for agriculture and farming, but I've had this unique experience of having grown up in a farm family. Love everything to do with farming, but I think the most important thing is the people. I love the people I work with. I love the team of really dedicated people that we've built here at Little Leaf Farms that have all bought into our reason to exist, which is to transform the way food is grown and 
We believe in this perimeter of urban markets, which used to be farms prior to World War II, where I live in Carlisle, Mass, Concord, Carlisle, all those, Lexington, they were all farms. And now it's suburbs. That area is not going to go back to supporting the cities with conventional field agriculture, but there are opportunities to build high-tech greenhouse operations like what we're doing at Little Leaf in return those perimeters of urban markets back as food production hubs. And that's our mission. I'm a little bit of a curmudgeon, and my heart breaks when I see all of these little farmers in New England trudging to farmer's market after farmer's market after farmer's market. It seems like a lot of work to sell a couple of heads of broccoli, but that's my perspective. So the idea that you can bring very efficient methods to them is great. Do you have any farmers who say, how can we do a small version of this on our own land? Well, it's a free market. So everything we do here is open for others to try to do and emulate in, in however they see fit. One thing I will note, there's been an explosion of what I call farms, small farms in Massachusetts, community yep. supported agriculture, as I'm sure you're aware. And so I think that's a great thing about opening up the Massachusetts consumers to locally grown fresh fruits and vegetables. But the issue is it's not moving the needle on the 10%. We only are growing 10% of the food that we consume here in Massachusetts and New England. So the reality is if you're going to the grocery industry, which is fairly consolidated, right? These are large companies. And so they don't allow store door delivery. They require you to have enough scale to then deliver to their distribution center. So therefore, there's a certain size you need to have as an agricultural producer right. if you're going to do business with the large groceries. Now, yes, we're in Massachusetts. We're on the larger end of a farm, but we are still a small producer, and we are up against the multi-billion dollar California behemoth in the marketplace. So we're certainly the kind of a small up-and-comer scrapper and no different than any other of the farmers here in, in Massachusetts and in Pennsylvania where we operate. Hmm. So you can, but you're of enough scale to be able to sell into a distribution center. And that was done on, yeah, that was done on purpose be, for that exact reason, because if you wanted to really transform the way food is grown, you need to get distribution, and to get distribution, you need to be of a size that you can deliver to the distribution centers for the grocers. Do you have a sense of what proportion of the lettuce you're selling in Massachusetts? Well, there's something called all commodity volume. It's called ACV, and it measures the the distribution that that a brand has in the marketplace. So we have the highest ACV numbers of any packaged lettuce company in the country in our core market of New England, where we have over 54% ACV penetration. Uh, in the Northeast, it's about 36%. So what? we have a lot of great customers that have supported us and that are wanting to give their customers, the, the final consumer, a fresher, tastier, locally grown product. For sure. The number that I heard a few years ago was that in New England, we only have about a three-day food supply. Should there be a disruption? I know that was tested very much during COVID. That, and that includes that we would run out of food after three days, including canned food, frozen food, fresh food. Do you know if that's still the case? Well, I can't comment specifically on, on how many days, but I mean, we saw this during COVID. I tell you, there was all kinds of disruption. And many of our customers really relied on us because as a food producer, we were deemed essential. So we just ran right through COVID during the crazy periods of March, April, May of 2020, if we all remember that. And it was really crazy. That really, I think, highlighted the need for a more resilient food system but I would not be surprised. Remember, 90% of the food we eat is produced elsewhere. So we are dependent upon the rest of the country, the rest of the world. And as a lifelong resident of New England, that troubles me a little bit. We're trying to do the best we can to fix that issue related to leafy greens. 
No, for sure. When I first heard those kinds of statistics, I suddenly looked at everything that I was eating and thought, wow, you've got some miles on you. That's not a good idea. Things can happen. There are wars. There are transportation crises. I did not at that point think there are pandemics. Our one acre of our production is the equivalent of 30 acres in field production. So, wow. yeah, and we don't use any pesticide, herbicides, or fungicides. So in many respects, we think we're beyond organic. And then obviously the whole localized nature of our, of our production, we're delivering it. Many of our DCs are 20 miles or less from where we're located. So this notion of cross-country transportation is just crazy. Our production process is highly automated, and we have a number of people in the packaging and forklift driving, obviously truck drivers, and then all of our office staff. So, yeah, we uh, employ company-wide about 250 people. Wow. That's a big employer, especially in the agricultural sector of Massachusetts. Uh, That includes Pennsylvania as well. Uh So Massachusetts, about half that. I have a question. So when I buy your product, it's really crisp. I don't have to wash it. It's just super crisp. And is that a function of the packaging or is that a function of the plant itself? It's a function of the variety, the way we grow it, the way we run our business, including our packaging, and making sure that what we're harvesting is in the store within 24 to 36 hours. Mm. So we've all experienced wilty lettuce, and we all know the reasons why. It's been too far from when it was harvested. Fundamentally, what we're really addressing is just better, fresher lettuce. And that means that you get the experience of getting that nice, crisp texture when you bite into one of our leaves. How long would do you recommend that people keep your packages in the refrigerator. What's the shelf life in the refrigerator? We say there's 15 to 17 days from harvest, but we've got plenty of stories where people have put them in and used them well after that. So yeah. just use your judgment and our lettuce is gonna hold up, but just like everything, it eventually will break down. So just use your best judgment. But we put 17 days from harvest on our package. I have to ask you just before we we close, because I know you're a busy guy, and I also know that you're six foot eight, and it says that you played basketball in Europe. Tell us about that. You're the only person I've ever spoken to directly, A, possibly who's six foot eight, and B, who played professional basketball in Europe. (laughs) I've had lifelong interest in basketball. I'm not playing anymore. I've gone on to other recreational activities like biking. When I was a, a sort of a youngster and a young man, I played at Cornell, and we were not very good, but still loved loved to play. And I went to a tryout camp after graduating for overseas jobs playing basketball. And I first went to South America, and I had a job offer from teams in Iceland and Argentina. And I had never been outside the country, and I didn't like the name of that country, Iceland. That didn't sound very attractive. That's it how, is a nice that's country, how, though. <laughs> by the way, that's how sophisticated I was, right, or lack thereof. So I decided to go to Argentina, and I'm so glad I did that. I had a great time down there, and then, then played in Europe for a number of years. And it allowed me to see the world and just live abroad at that formative time in your life. And I'm so glad I had that opportunity. And I really thank basketball for allowing me to do that. (laughs) I just love the idea that you went from playing basketball all over Argentina to essentially creating these amazing greenhouses. A wonderfully idiosyncratic career arc, for sure. Yes, I would agree. (laughs) This is great. I am a dedicated Little Leaf Farm customer. Well, so, you're invited to come out for a visit, so just let really? me know. I would love to do that. We operate seven days a week, and you're just let me know when you're available, and I'll personally give you a tour. Oh, I would love to do that. Thank you. This is so much fun to talk to you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. All right. T- take care. All the best. Thank you, Paul. And listeners, if you want to know where you can get Little Leaf Farms in your neighborhood, visit their website, littleleaffarms.com. Thanks for listening. Let's Talk About Food is produced by The Food Voice. I'm producing, along with audio director and composer Mike Moss, of Soundscape Boston. 
You can find more of our stories at our website, letstalkaboutfood.com, and on Heritage Radio or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's Talk About Food is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.